Radio. You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Hello, kitties, and welcome to my world. I would come over and say hello to you, but it's just as easy for you to come to me. Yes, yes, come in. You've come to the right place. This is where you'll learn everything there is to know about your furry feline friends. I'm talking about cats. Yes, I know. We are positively perfect pets. What do you mean I have attitude? Why, of course I do. I'm a cat. It's called Catitude. As I was saying, this show is all about cats. Cats and... Uh, oh, yes, uh, cats. So let me introduce you to my accomplice. I mean, assistant and host of Catitude, Tom Doc. Okay, Tom, tell them how wonderful we cats are. It's okay. You have my permission. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Pet Life Radio and the Catitude Channel. I'm your host, Tom Doc, and I am very glad to be back here. Had a little bit of a break this summer. Had myself, uh, came down with a case of Bell's palsy. And if you can believe it or not, that actually paralyzes half of your face. And so talking, although I could still talk, I just sounded like I had a lot of mush in my mouth, at least to me. And so I decided we'd take a little break. I talked with the folks at Life Radio and decided to take a little break. And I do apologize for any delay in getting back to talking about our favorite animal friends, those kitty cats. So let's get started without further ado. Have a little bit of catching up to do. We're going to talk today about a couple of forest cats, the Norwegian forest cat and the Siberian. Um, Siberian is one of the newest breeds that uh, was accepted for championship status by the CFA. And the Norwegian really isn't that much older, actually first coming to the States here in 1979. So we'll be talking about those today and then a little bit later, as we do in our second part of the show, we always spend a little bit of time finding out what's going on at the Veterinary News Network and PetDocsOnCall.com and find out what kind of animal stories are in the news. And I've got a real good one today about how to keep your pet from getting lost or getting uh, taken away from you and um, we all know about tags and microchips but there's a new internet service that I think you guys are really really going to be interested in so we need to find a trivia question for today and of course since uh, both of these breeds the Siberian and the Norwegian forest cat are reasonably new to the United States within the last 30 years. We haven't seen a lot of them on the uh, silver screen or on the little TV screen, so there's not too many I can talk about as far as a trivia question for that. But, and you'll understand this as we go into the history of the Norwegian forest cat, they are thought to be ancestors of two other cat breeds. So, I guess my trivia question for today, for all of you cat lovers out there, is going to be the Norwegian forest cat is thought to be the ancestor of what other two registered cat breeds. So, think on that. We're going to take a short break to say hi to our sponsors, and I'll be right back after these messages. Ooh, do I hear a can being opened? I believe I smell tuna. Catitude will return after these messages. That should give me enough time to investigate what's going on in the kitchen. Don't have a hissy fit. We'll be right back. Tired of wasting money on giant boxes of litter that don't work and don't last? Switch to World's Best Cat Litter, the only litter with concentrated power. So even a small bag lasts one cat 30 days. Outstanding odor control, quick clumping, lightweight. It's even flushable. World's Best Cat Litter. Everything else is just litter. Find it near you at www.itsnotjustlitter.com. That's www.itsnotjustlitter.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. How dare they open a can of tuna and make a sandwich out of it? I can see why some of my celebrity pals prefer lasagna. Well, anyway, I did manage to grab myself the canary while I was in there. Quiet, bird. We're going to hear the rest of my show, Catitude. If you behave, I may not eat you. Until later. Hmm. Okay, Tom, you may continue. 
And we are back once again at the Catitude Channel here on Pet Life Radio at PetLifeRadio.com. I sure hope you are enjoying these shows. I do enjoy doing these shows for you and helping you learn a little bit more about your favorite feline friends. And as I mentioned today, we're going to be talking about Norwegian forest cats and Siberian cats. But first, let's answer that trivia question. I wanted to know what two cat breeds are considered to be potential descendants of the Norwegian forest cat. And as we start talking about the Norwegian forest cat, this is going to start making sense to you. But it is thought that the Maine Coon here in the United States and the Manx over there across the sea in Britain are descendants of the Norwegian forest cat. So hopefully you got that trivia question right. Wish I could give a prize for you, but Sorry, that's just not in the budget today. So let's talk a little bit about the Norwegian forest cat and a little bit about the history of them. The Norwegian forest cat, or the scowl cat, as they are known in um, Norway, uh, that's actually Norse for forest cat, and they have been featured in folklore for many, many centuries. And it is really likely that they traveled on Viking ships. And if you follow any kind of um, archaeological or historical type data, you know that the Vikings were already making uh, inroads over here to North America as early as the uh, 11th and 12th centuries. And so the Vikings carried a lot of these cats on their ships to help keep the rats out of the grain. And, and um, you know, these are, are big cats. You know, you think of Vikings when you see these cats. And so I can really imagine that some of these cats were left behind in several different places, whether they were raiding along uh, the English coast and Scotland and Ireland and all those islands that are right there in the British Isles, or coming across from Iceland and Greenland and going down the Canadian and North American coast. And I can really see some of these cats potentially being left behind and uh, leaving future genetic material for the development of the Maine Coon here in the in North America and the Manx cat there in the British Isles. So that kind of makes sense to me. Now, they also were featured, like I said, in folklore. And if you're into any kind of mythology at all, I think that the Norse gods are probably one of the most interesting pantheon of gods um, out there. Most people know about Greek and Roman gods, but the Norse gods are very, very interesting. And the goddess Freya, who is the goddess of beauty and love and, and fertility as well, she's the uh, goddess that named Friday. Um, so when we say TGIF, we can really sing, thank God it's Freya, because it's really Friday. She often was seen in a chariot that was rolled out by cats. The cats were actually harnessed to the chariot. And of course, Norwegian forest cat lovers say that it's probably the horsepower for this chariot was probably provided by Norwegian forest cats. And I can certainly believe that um, thinking back on, on the mythological pictures that I saw and just thinking about the size of these guys as well. Now, as far as more history on this forest cat, now they've been around for thousands of years, definitely tens of centuries, but more likely thousands of years. And these are cats that just developed very close to the Arctic Circle. So you know they're going to be a bigger, tougher type of animal, just like uh, we talked about several shows ago when we talked about the Maine Coon having to deal with the harsh North American winters. Um, they developed a robustness and a thick coat and everything like that. So these cats are all ubiquitous to the area of Norway, and most Norwegians just thought of them as cats until they didn't start seeing them a lot anymore. And that was back in the 1920s and 1930s. And so a dedicated group of people got together and said, we need to make sure that we save this cat, that we save this lineage, and actually started referring to it as a special breed of cat. Now, it actually showed up in a cat show in Germany in 1938, and people would just went crazy over this cat. Just amazing, amazed at the size and, and the silkiness of the fur and the thickness of the fur, and they really liked it. But that pesky little conflict of World War II once again got in the way, like it did with so many of our cat breeds, and the Norwegian forest cat was somewhat forgotten for many decades. Um, it was in the 1960s, I believe, designated the official cat of Norway by King Olaf, but it really didn't show up here in the United States until 1979. And after that, it really took off like most of these new breeds do, or breeds that we've not seen before that they do. And it was accepted for registration in 1987 and actually for championship status in 1993. 
So there's a little bit of history about the Norwegian forest cat. Now, what about, what do they look like? Well, I've already mentioned that they're big cats. Um, it's not unusual for these guys to push 20 pounds, if not a little more. And this is a big, solid cat, not a fat cat. They do have very thick coats. They've got two coats, and they will lose the undercoat in warmer weather. And so uh, there's an old saying in Norway that the uh, cat actually takes off his winter underwear. Um, and you actually see somewhat of a different cat because the coat is not quite so thick in the summertime. Um, they do have water-resistant guard hairs, which makes sense if you're going to be around a cold environment where it's going to snow. And these guys also do like water to a certain extent. Um, when you look at them, they've got those tufts coming out of the ear. So you've got those inner ear hairs that are quite long. And that's fairly unique with cat breeds. You don't see too many cats that have any kind of inner hair where you can actually see it coming out of the ear itself, out of the, uh, the pinna or the ear flap. Big, big, impressive tail, big mane on the males. Um, they do have tufted feet to help them get grip and traction. That's the word I'm looking for in the snow. They do, what's interesting is their rear legs are actually longer than their front legs, which again gives them a very unique look when they're standing there. These guys are very slow to develop and it's not unusual for them to take about five years to actually mature and get to their full size and get their full coat thickness and everything like that. And if you're looking for a Norwegian forest cat you do have a variety of colors to choose from both you know from bi colors and and torties and um and tabbies and mackerels and solid colors i even saw a listener sent me pictures of some blue norwegian forest cats that she was looking at which is a very unique thing i may have mentioned in uh, in previous shows the only thing that are not allowed you cannot have the pointed colors so there can't be any siamese looking maine coons Okay. These guys are very much a homebody. They do enjoy their people very much. They enjoy other pets. Although they are built for the outdoors, they do enjoy staying indoors. You just have to give them some good places to climb on. So get several cat trees of varying heights. Uh, make sure any of your breakables aren't uh, somewhere where they can have access to it. Although they are very graceful, like most cats are, you know, they're a big cat and occasionally they're going to knock something over. Now, you would think, looking at this cat, that grooming would be a big issue, just like, you know, a Persian or a Himalayan, that you're going to have to spend a lot of time. But really, it isn't. And again, an old Norwegian saying is, you know, Mother Nature designed these cats, and she doesn't have hairdressers out in the forest. And so a once-a-week brushing is really all that these cats really need to help keep their coat free of mats and everything like that. And the thought is that the coat developed because these cats constantly were brushing up against low branches and, and stumps and things like that to get rid of any kind of parasites uh, and get rid of the shedding hair they shed during the summertime. So they developed a coat that was very easily managed. Um, as I've mentioned before, these guys need climbing devices. They are big cats, but they like to be up high, which makes sense in a forest type setting. You do have to watch for a couple of health problems. And again, remember that even though they've been here in the United States for about 30 years, this is still a fairly young breed. And uh, we are still seeing some issues that are cropping up. We don't know all about uh, the recessive traits and everything. So we know that there's a few issues that are still going to crop up every once in a while. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we've talked about before in other shows. Um, that's a problem with the heart uh, where it actually gets the muscles get too large and it doesn't contract well enough. Enough. They do have something called glycogen storage disease where they can't basically take the glucose from their food, convert it to glycogen and store it as uh, an emergency energy source like other animals can. So you need to watch for those. Those would be cats that aren't going to be pretty poor doers. They never, they're not thrifty. They never grow right. And then also cleft palate. Now this is something that's usually very easily seen um, by the veterinarian when they do a postpartum exam after the queen has her kittens. So you want to watch for those kind of things. And certainly if you ever get into breeding the Ouija's as they're known here in the United States, you want to make sure you don't breed a cat that throws off uh, kittens with cleft palates. So, interesting cat. I mean, just a wonderful looking, big, robust cat. And as some of the websites have said, they're really built for success and totally a splendid creation. So, thank you, Mother Nature. Thank you, Freya. Whoever uh, put this cat together, they did a really, really good job. Now, another forest cat that has uh, started hitting the scene here in the United States in just the last few years is the Siberian cat or uh, a national cat of Russia. 
Now, these guys didn't show up here in the States until around 1990 and actually weren't recognized until 2000 and only a few years ago. In 2006, did they actually achieve championship status with the CFA. But recorded history and many of these different books that come out of Russia and, and the, um, all those states over there show that this breed has been around for about a thousand years. Uh, and, and an interesting thing about them is some owners think that they are potentially better for people who are allergic to cats. That is that they produce less of that skin protein that comes off and causes the allergies in people. Not been scientifically shown, but again, it's sometimes hard to argue with anecdotal evidence. And so a lot of breeders and owners who take a look at these cats actually like them for the fact that they have lower allergens. Now, they will look very similar to a Maine Coon, but they don't have the... Uh, the, the robustness. They are still a good hefty cat getting somewhere up around maybe 12 to 15 pounds, but not quite as big as the uh, Norwegian forest cat. I think I said Maine Coon a minute ago. I meant the Norwegian forest cat. They have a three layer hair. It's a semi long hair. They have guard hair, the on and the down. And what's interesting about these guys, unlike the Norwegian forest cats, is they have a whole range of colors, including pointed cat. So you can have kind of a Siamese looking forest cat. They actually are shown in some of the smaller cat registries as a new breed called Neva Masquerade. That's N-E-V-A Masquerade. And that is named because they are first found around the Neva River in Russia and Masquerade, of course, for the fact that they look like they have a mask on, meaning the points that they have. These guys, just like Norwegian forest cats, uh, which I think they're probably cousins, are very loyal to the family and evidently seem to be a good problem solver. So when I read things like that, what that means is you need to put the treats away, you need to put things up where the cat can't get at them because it's obvious that they know how to uh, get into things. They also, being a fairly young breed at this point in time, we're still finding out what kind of uh, health problems they have. There is a factor nine deficiency, which is a bleeding type of disorder. They do develop polycystic kidney disease. We've talked about that in our Persians and Himalayans. You can do a genetic test for that to make sure that your cat doesn't have that, and it can also be noticed on ultrasound. And then again, like the Norwegian forest cats, they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So there's a little bit of a look at two of the newer breeds that we're seeing and two of the larger breeds. I've been visiting a new forum called feline-forum.com. Uh, it's a place where cat lovers are getting together and talking about uh, their different breeds that they like. And it seems like these big cats, like the Norwegian forest cats, like the Maine Coons, are starting to really pick up in popularity. And we've talked about this before, too, with some of the crosses that are going on with wild cats. Um, the Savannah cat, which is a very, very large cat, it's, uh, it's almost as if we're trying to extend the size the upper size limit of our cats just like we did with the dogs and you know we there's only so far we can go with that before we start running into um, actual physiological and genetic limitations but i think that more people are looking at you know something that's a little bit bigger a little heftier almost if you want to say kind of a man's cat so i don't know if that's really truly the case or not but uh, it's certainly they are raising in popularity right now so we are going to go to a break here. Hang on. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about new ways to keep your pet safe from getting lost. Ooh, do I hear a can being opened? I believe I smell tuna. Catitude will return after these messages. That should give me enough time to investigate what's going on in the kitchen. Don't have a hissy fit. We'll be right back. Molly, here's your dinner. <coughs> Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. The Cat Tree Tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your cat tree tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. Let's 
Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. How dare they open a can of tuna and make a sandwich out of it. I can see why some of my celebrity pals prefer lasagna. Well, anyway, I did manage to grab myself the canary while I was in there. Quiet, bird. We're going to hear the rest of my show, Catitude. If you behave, I may not eat you until later. Mm. Okay, Tom, you may continue. And welcome back once again to the second part of our show here on the Catitude Channel today. I, of course, am Tom Doc, your feline friend and hopefully friend to all felines. Um, we just got done talking about a couple new breeds and is, as we normally do at this point in the show, we start talking about a little bit of stuff that's happening in the news, things where cats are, are in the news, um, and a lot of information that I get, of course, comes from the Veterinary News Network at myvnn.com. That's the Veterinary News Network at my vnn.com and one of our newest stories that we have going at myvnn.com is a new service where they actually utilize the internet to help reunite lost pets and their owners now how interesting is that now we all think about you know tags and and people of course think about microchips but for some reason and i don't know why this is a lot of cat owners shy away from microchips they don't think about microchipping their cats Yet, if they have a dog or two, they will definitely microchip their dog. And it's maybe because we let our dogs outside to go to the bathroom and we tend to keep our cats inside that we don't think we need it. But honestly, having some form of identification on your cat is is really vital. And I like microchips because they can't get lost. They don't get, you know, thrown away with the breakaway collar when the cat gets caught on something. So... It's a good permanent form of identification. But let's back up a little bit here. You know, how likely is it that your pet will actually get lost? Well, there's been studies from several of the, of course, you know, microchip companies and tag companies. So they've got a vested interest in this. But also the American Humane Association has looked at this. And at some point in their lifetime, about one third of all pets will go missing from their homes. So if you take the population of our pets on an annual basis, what that means is about 5 million pets go missing every year. That's just an outstanding, or excuse me, astounding number to me. 5 million dogs and cats go missing. Well, here's what makes it sadder, is that only 17% of dogs and a minuscule 2% of cats find their way back to their owners. Let me repeat that. Only 2% of cats find their way back to their owners when they're lost. That's just that's just very sad. And again, a lot of it, I think, is because we don't tend to utilize identification on our pets like we do on our dogs. And of course, as you guys know, a lot of these pets, they get picked up because they're friendly because they were your cat and they get picked up and they're friendly and they go to a shelter and you know they'll sit there for the required amount of time and the shelter runs out of room and sadly they're euthanized and you know as much as you want to blame the shelter you know and there is some some blame to be had there they are just overcrowded and it's it's part of our throwaway society where people just you know if they don't want an animal anymore they take it out to the country and they dump it and when i lived in a rural area that happened routinely where i'd see a new cat or a new dog running alongside the road where i knew that animal had not been there before so point one put identification on your pet If you're going to use a tag on a collar, you know, the hard thing with cats is we like to use the breakaway collars because we think if they get hung up, they can break away and and then they're free and they're not dead, you know, from hanging somewhere. But the breakaway collars, of course, are going to lose their identification too. So that might be one step is go ahead and get a tag so that people can see your cat has ID, but also microchip. And you can go to your veterinarian, you can go to your local shelter. There's always microchip events going on where you can get a good low cost microchip. And when you get the microchip please please and this is point number two and we've talked about this before register in the appropriate database it does no good to microchip the pet and then forget to put the information in the database because all that does is delay the time until your pet can make it back to you because you've got to track down where that microchip went to first to the shelter and then the shelter's got to look through their records or the veterinarian's got to look through their records and all of this is is a very time consuming process and it can lead to delayed or even failed reunions. 
of those pets that do have microchips, and again, remember, most of them are dogs, only about 5% have a microchip, and fewer than half of those are registered with accurate information. So that's pretty sad. So if you're going to get a microchip, make sure you go onto the database and put the right information in and keep it up to date. It's important to keep it up to date. People move. I think the average is once every seven years, people move and uh, you need to let the company know that you've moved and so that they can track down the right information. So what about this new internet thing? That's the whole point I wanted to talk about today. Well, there is a new site. It's called helpmefindmypet.com. Run all five of those words together. Helpmefindmypet.com and go to that site. You'll really like it. And I found these folks on Twitter, actually. You know, with all the uh, new stuff that we're doing at the Veterinary News Network and our, and our entry into social media with PetDocsOnCall.com, we're spending a lot of time on Facebook. Facebook and Twitter and, and seeing all the pet lovers that are there. And this company came about and what they're doing is they're actually utilizing the social media to increase pet recovery rates. And I think this is just a really neat thing to do. First of all, they don't say that your pet has to have a microchip in order to be part of their database. You sign up, you pay their low fee. I don't recall what it is off the top of my head, but you can go to the website and see. And you can put pictures of your pet up there, anything about your pet that's important, the name, the color, strange behaviors, any special medications, who the veterinarian is, all that kind of good stuff. And then if your pet is lost, you call them, you send them an email, and they will send out an alert, an email alert and a fax alert to every veterinary office, animal shelter, grooming parlor, pet store, and any affiliated helpmefindmypet.com member. So any individual person who happens to be on their website within a 50 mile radius of where your pet was lost, 50 miles. And if you do that immediately, the odds are that you're going to find your pet a lot faster. And that's, I think, what a lot of people don't realize is they want to take their time and they want to say, oh, he'll find his way home. She'll find her way home. You know, they've got good instincts. They'll find their way home. But it's really, you need to be proactive and you need to start looking immediately. And if you can get the word out there and people can start looking, then a lot of times you're going to get your, your pet back. In fact, this company says that they've got an 87% recovery rate for pets and they never give up. They will continually broadcast alerts until the pet is found or until you tell them to stop. So I think, you know, that this is just an absolutely wonderful idea. And I get reminded every day when I'm on Twitter and on my tweet deck and I see one of the little things pop up and says, you know, orange cat found in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, or tuxedo cat found in Miami, Florida. It's absolutely wonderful, the job that they're doing. And I want to give them just a good shout out and, you know, go visit their site, helpmefindmypet.com. There's a couple other sites out there, too. They're maybe not quite as well known, and I don't think they utilize the same type of um, internet and social media as much. But Amber Alert for Pets and findtoto.com, find, T-O-T-O, Dot com. So talk with your veterinarian, get an ID system on your pet, whether it's a tag and a microchip or just a microchip, and then be proactive. You know, of course, follow local leash laws. Don't let your cat roam if he's not supposed to be roaming. One, because that's irritating to your neighbors. And two, there's a chance that he could get hurt or, or lost. Also, spay and neuter your pets. That's going to help lessen their urge to wander too. And if they're lost, again, act immediately. The faster you respond to a disappearance, the better your odds are at finding your pet safe. One final note on this. If your pet is lost and you are visiting or you are calling local shelters and take this from a person who worked in a shelter for several years, you need to visit the shelter daily. You need to personally go and look for your pet daily because what you are describing as a mackerel tabby to the shelter employee may be a marble tabby or maybe a, an Asa cat looking cat or a spotted cat. You know, you've got to go in there and see. And, um, you know, your description of the cat may be perfect for what you think the cat looks like. But remember, you're talking to somebody over the phone and you're also talking to somebody who's probably pretty busy and may not have the time. They should go look. I'm not saying they shouldn't go look, but they may just look real quick and say, you know, that doesn't look like it. I don't think that's it. And they may not even know the sex of the cat. So you need to go and visit the local shelter daily. Do not rely on the shelter staff 
to make sure that they're going to call you if your cat shows up there. So, a little bit of interesting information there for you. I hope you liked it, and uh, it's good to be back and, and doing this. We're still not 100% with this Bell's Palsy yet, but we're going to get there, and uh, we'll sound real good here very, very shortly. So, before we end the show today, I would like to just thank our sponsors. So, thanks again for listening. We really appreciate your time, and I look forward to seeing you guys here again soon. Take care. Want to know what cats like to eat for breakfast? Mice Krispies, of course. Learn everything there is to know about cats on Catitude with your host, Tom Doc. Each week, we'll spotlight a cool cat breed, give up-to-date advice on cat health, and check out spiffy new cat products. So curl up on the couch every week for a perfectly enjoyable time on Catitude. Every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. 